Hello and welcome to Aqua Rach. Today I am, well, first of all, I'm going to apologize for any background noise that you might hear. I'm doing something a little differently today. I typically do a voiceover for my videos, but today this video I thought would be much easier if I just try to talk and do the video at the same time. So you'll probably hear my animals making noises in the background kind of unavoidable. I usually do my voiceovers at night when they're asleep, but right now they're kind of scuttering around and doing their thing. So today I just wanted to make a really quick video where I give an overview of all of my watercolor supplies that I use in my studio. So I thought I would just take the opportunity to do that. And I'm going to go ahead and just dive right in. So... Of course, the first thing that I want to talk about is my actual watercolors. In this little container, these are the watercolors that I use most often right now. And I use three different brands. I'm not going to go over every single color that I have because I do have a lot at this point. Not something I recommend. I think you should start out with just a basic set. So I use Daniel Smith, which is a really great brand, and all of the watercolors that I'm using right now in my studio are tubes. Let's see here. So then I also have Windsor & Newton. And then the last brand that I use is, I know it's not very obvious, this says M. Graham. And this is the only set of M. Graham watercolors that I own. And I did a video on this set, and I've been having a lot of fun with this very limited palette. And I highly recommend these. The unique thing about these M. Graham watercolors is that they don't harden up in the palette, even several days after not using them. They still stay a little bit soft, and so that makes it really easy to reactivate them, and I've found that they are just very, very rich and really wonderful watercolors. It says that they're made with honey for richer color, and that prevents hardening. And I'll be quite honest with you, I might switch over to this brand. I still have a lot of Daniel Smith and Windsor & Newton, and there's nothing wrong with these brands whatsoever. They're really good, but I do really like how rich these are, and I like that they don't completely harden up. It just makes them so easy to use. And then I do have a few gouache tubes. This one is white. You can see I've used it quite a bit. The other tubes of gouache that I have, I really haven't used much at all. And then these really small ones, these are all Daniel Smith. And if you buy one of the sets of Daniel Smith watercolors, um, they have the Primatech line, which is what this is from. And then they have just their basics or primary line. And they just come in these really, really small tubes. They're not too badly priced, though. And I think if you're just exploring or just trying to figure out what you like that's not a bad size but I do find that with the watercolors I or the colors that I use a lot I spring for the larger tubes when I need to replenish so you can see quite a size difference between this little sample set of the Daniel Smith's and then this is kind of a large tube um, 1.25 ounces in the Windsor and Newton because I use this color a lot. I run out really fast. And here it's just more watercolors. These are ones that they might be tubes that are a little bit newer and so I've separated them out from the other ones so I can use these up first. And then I also have my gouache tubes in here. And I have very few tubes of gouache. I think I just got like a, a starter pack just so I could try them out. And I just really haven't done a lot with them yet. And then it also came with a black and a white. So there was a green, blue, yellow, red, black, and white that came in this set. So I'll put those aside. Now I'm going to show you both of the palettes that I use. This is the first watercolor palette that I ever had. And it's just plastic. 
and it was maybe four dollars but I really like it I like that it has this thumb hole so if I'm outdoors painting and I don't have anywhere to set my palette I can hold it like this and paint and there's lots of room to mix there's plenty of wells really more than I need and I don't use this in my studio very often because I really prefer my porcelain palette. So this is the one that you'll usually see in my videos. I haven't had this palette for a very long time, but I definitely wanted a porcelain palette and there are lots of wells in here. There is a little space for a paintbrush, although none of my paintbrushes are that small to be honest. So I don't really use that, but it's fine. And it comes with this lid that doubles as a mixing tray, which I really enjoy using. And I just like the feeling of mixing watercolors on porcelain or ceramic. And if you go onto Etsy, there are so many ceramic watercolor palettes that come in so many different unique shapes and sizes and designs. And so I re really recommend that. But also, everything that I'm showing you here I have in a list that I've compiled on Amazon. And right now this is not like an affiliates type thing. I'm not promoting these products for my own personal gain. These are just what I use and so I put together a list on Amazon that I share in the description of all of my videos. Alright, so let's talk about brushes. This is basically all that I have for brushes. This case right here came with a set of brushes from Jack Richeson, but not all of these brushes are Jack Richeson, so they all are except for this one. This is my mop brush. It is made from Squirrel, which, you know, I kind of feel bad about, and I probably won't buy any more um, natural brushes. I'm, I'm going to usually just go for the synthetics to be quite honest um, but this one works pretty good as a mop brush and then the rest of these are synthetic these are all Jack Richeson let me let my dogs outside I guess okay um, so these are all synthetic they come in different sizes and shapes and I like them they were not overly expensive by any means, and I feel like the variety is good enough that I on, only usually use maybe one or two of these brushes when I'm working on a painting. I don't think I've used this one at all, because I just don't usually see a need for it. Most of the time, a watercolor brush that just has a nice pointy tip will do most fine lines that I need to do. So... I guess it's always good to have too many rather than too few. Every time I put these little plastic protectors back on my brushes, I usually end up doing more damage than good, so I'm just going to leave it off. But I like this because I can protect my brushes in this case and lay them flat. You should never dry your brushes. Obviously, you don't want to put them in water or even in an empty glass with their bristles facing down because you're going to warp the bristles and you're going to wear out the binding that's holding your brush together. But you also don't want to store a wet brush upright like this because then the water soaks down into the brush. And so it's always best to try to dry your brushes lying flat. So this case gives me a little bit of protection and allows me to lie them flat, and then I, don't, I also don't risk losing them because they're all in here. Oh, except I just forgot to put my mop brush back. And you can buy synthetic squirrel brushes, and so that's what I'll do when I need to. I'll just buy a synthetic one. My little dog likes to go in and outside, and my studio is right by my back door, so she gets excited every time she wants to um, go outside and see what's going on. Okay, so speaking of brushes, these are Hake brushes. They're made by Mandalay, and I have mixed feelings about these. 
I haven't had them very long and I bought them in a set. So there's two other brushes, but this is the largest and this is the smallest. And I find that even the small one is almost too big for most things that I want to do with it. So I haven't used any of the larger sizes at all. There's two more that came in the set and this is the only one I've used, obviously. It's a little bit stained. And so what I like about this is it's really good for doing a wash or putting water down on paper. But what I don't like about it is that the bristles come out really easily. And so I usually find that there's little bristles on my painting, which with watercolor painting, that's not a big deal. It's a bigger deal with oil painting because if those bristles dry into your paint, then they're in there forever where you have to tear them out. So not a big deal, just a little bit annoying maybe. Oh, and before I forget, this is a good example of how I arrange my colors. So I try to arrange them in order. So I start with my yellows usually because they're my lightest value. And then I work around kind of in order of the rainbow. And if I have any like specialty colors like these, I try to just keep them all grouped together because obviously these are all some variation of like blue and turquoise. And I have my blues over here, green here. Um, so since these are kind of specialty colors that I bought individually just because, they're all just kind of together so I can keep track of those. And then my porcelain palette, it's not as good of an example as that, as that one. But you can see over here, these are all my primaries on this side. So my yellows, reds, this is a yellow I use just for mixing green so you can see why that would be. Yellow tends to get very dirty when you mix it with blue. And then here are my Primatech colors. So my Daniel Smith Primatechs are all over there. And then I have a couple of my specialty blues here. And then these are those M. Graham colors right in there. So I've got room for them on my palette. They don't make as much sense in the way that they're arranged. But I do try to arrange my palette in a way that I can just remember which colors I put where. I think that that's really important. Okay, so moving on again to brushes. This is a toothbrush, obviously. And I don't use like a used toothbrush that I used to brush my teeth with. I just buy like a really cheap $1 toothbrush that I don't mind ruining. And obviously I use this just to splatter masking fluid whenever I need to, especially when I want to do something like stars or snow, something that I want to be a little bit more random. And then these are silicone applicators. And I use these to apply masking fluid in a more controlled way. So I just dip this into my masking fluid and apply that to my paper and there's different sizes, so they allow me to do slightly different things. And I really like these because masking fluid will absolutely destroy your paintbrush. Don't use masking fluid on a paintbrush. Even if you wash it right away, it really does a number on your paintbrush. So I just never, ever use a paintbrush with my masking fluid. I'm always going to use something else. And then another tool that I have for masking fluid. can't remember what this is called, but I do believe it is in my list of supplies in the description of all my videos. And you can adjust the width of this. Let me get this focused. There we go. So I can narrow the width here. And then I can dip this in my masking fluid. And however wide these two prongs are from each other, that's how wide the masking fluid will apply. So the masking fluid kind of builds up in between these. And then I apply them to the, or I apply this applicator to the paper like this. And the masking fluid transfers from this device onto the paper. So I'll have to do a video where I kind of put this into action because I think it's hard to visualize exactly what this does. But I've really enjoyed this tool. It gives you a lot more control because even with these tools, even with the finest tool, 
I find that I can't get like a really even line. I still get some imperfections in the line. So I only use this when I don't mind having some imperfections or if I actually want that. And with this, I can have a lot more control in how I apply the masking fluid. All right, so these are water brushes and these ones are empty right now and I don't use these in my studio very often these are mostly for sketching and I'll do a separate video on sketching supplies but I do really like these you've probably seen them before if you watch other watercolor videos but you just fill them with water and then you can use this to paint very easily and you don't necessarily have to have a cup of water by your side so I thought I would throw those in there and then let's talk about some mediums and masking fluid. So I use Winsor & Newton masking fluid. It's not terribly expensive, but I have found that when I buy really cheap masking fluids, they just don't work very well. So I haven't tried a lot of the, um, you know, nice brands of masking fluid. This is really the only one and it works pretty well for me. So I'll probably stick with it. And now let's look at some mediums, which I do not use very often but I got them all in a set and I really need to experiment with them more. So these are all gonna be from Winsor & Newton. This is a texture medium and these are all watercolor mediums. So you can add this to your watercolor and I guess it gives some texture. I'll have to do a video experimenting with all of these. The next one is called iridescent medium. So I really need to use this because I love iridescence. It's one of my favorite things, so I need to experiment with this a little bit more. I tend to be pretty basic in my painting, so I don't spring for a lot of mediums. Even when I do oil painting, I don't use a lot of mediums. Next one is gum arabic. I keep losing focus here. Sorry about that. And I don't really know what this does. I think it makes your painting look a little bit more glossy in areas where you mix this in with your paint. But actually one thing I use gum arabic for is if I have a paintbrush that's lost its shape, I can dip the brush into this and then kind of reform the bristles and it will harden and it'll kind of reform the brush back into its original shape. So it's kind of useful for that as well. And then the last Oh, I guess it's not a medium. I just have another container of masking fluid. And this is what happens to your masking fluid after a while. Because when masking fluid comes into contact with oxygen, that's when it hardens. And so this is a really old bottle and I'd use most of it up anyway. But let's see if I can open it. And you'll see it's just all like dried up and it's turned solid in there. So this needs to just actually go in the garbage. All right, let's talk about paper. First, I'll show you a couple of sketchbooks. So this is a sketchbook I just recently finished up. And I've been using this one for quite a while. I'm not too good about using sketchbooks up, although I'm getting a little bit better. So this one's all filled up. This is a Moleskine or Moleskine. Don't really know how to pronounce the brand, but I really recommend this paper. I really like it. It's um it's pretty legit, so it's really difficult to find a good quality watercolor sketchbook that's really worth using. So this is Moleskine or Moleskine. Really like it. It's obviously very small, but it fits perfectly into my little sketch pack that I have. I think it's like three and a half by five and a half inches, something like that. So it's very portable. And I got pretty used to the size pretty fast. At, when I first got it, I thought it might be too small, but even as I hold it now, I feel like it's a good size sketchbook. The sketchbook that I use a lot for, you know, just real like brainstorming kind of sketches is this cheap Canson mixed media. And so this is the one I've used in a few videos so far. But this is where, you know, if I need to do any kind of problem solving on a painting, this is the one I go to because it's very inexpensive. I think it was about five or six dollars for this whole thing and it takes watercolor and water media and ink pretty well so no complaints really. But the paper is definitely a lot thinner. I usually 
use some masking tape to just kind of like tape a border around my sketches so that I don't have so much surface area. The more surface area that you use on paper like this, the more buckling you're going to get. So I use tape just to kind of limit the surface area that I'm using to sketch, and that helps a lot with buckling. My dogs are fighting in the background. I hope that you can't hear them too well. Okay, so this is a watercolor block, and in a watercolor block, the edges of all the pages are bound together, and so you get a minimal amount of buckling when you apply a lot of water to a watercolor block. This is 140 pound. This, I tore the cover off of it, but it's a Winsor & Newton brand. It's 100% cotton, uh, 300 pounds. And it's really good. I like it. It's a little bit on the pricey side, so I don't use this just to kind of goof around. I use this for final paintings. And then I have an intermediate paper, which is this Fabriano. This is 140 pounds as well, but instead of being 100% cotton, this is only 25% cotton. But I do find that it is a much better quality than most of your cheap watercolor papers, which are 100% synthetic and don't have any natural fibers. So this works a lot better. I really like the texture. It's a little bit unique. I don't know if I'll be able to really show you the texture, but it has more of a regular texture, which I'm sure I can't really get a good comparison, but the natural fiber in this book, the texture is a little bit more irregular and, you know, more natural. And then the texture on this paper is a little bit more regular, which for some reason I kind of like that. But this is a good intermediate paper that I like to work on paintings, whether they're going to be final paintings or I'm kind of preparing for a more final painting that's going to be very challenging and I want a decent quality paper without spending a ton of money. This is kind of what I go for and I really like it. So I do recommend that. In a lot of videos, you'll see me using carbon paper. So if I do a sketch on copy paper or something like that, I use carbon paper to transfer the sketch onto my watercolor paper so that I can minimize the amount of kind of sketchiness or erasing that I need to do on my actual watercolor paper because especially erasing will damage the fibers of your watercolor paper. The other thing that I sometimes use to paint on is Illustration Board. This is by Crescent Brand. And Illustration Board is basically a good quality acid-free paper that is attached to cardboard. So this is cardboard, and then here is paper. And this is kind of a hot press, so there isn't much texture to this at all. And I like this because obviously it's not going to buckle. It's very rigid. And I don't use this very often, but I do use it when I need a lot of control. And then another thing that I sometimes use are these watercolor pencils. This is by Derwent. And there's 24 pencils in here. I don't use these a lot because, again, I'm pretty simple when it comes to watercolor. I kind of just stick to the basics. But I think this is good sometimes, too, when you are doing plein air painting and you need to do a sketch and you don't want your pencil lines to show through. It's a good idea to just use watercolor pencils because they will at least partially dissolve when you apply water. And then the last thing I'll show you is kind of no big deal, but this is just a piece of hardboard or masonite board that I got at the local hardware store lumber yard and I had them just cut down some boards for me. I use these for oil painting so you can actually um, prime these, gesso these, and then actually paint on them. But I like to use some of them just as backing. I don't like to tape my watercolor paper directly to my table because I like that I can move this around or tilt it as needed. So I recommend having something like this that you can attach your watercolor paper to that you can actually move around and it isn't just stuck to your table. Because when it is just stuck to your table, whether it's at an angle or it's flat, 
Um, I think it's best just to have a little bit of control over how you can move the board to maybe move the paint around, move the water around, prevent any kind of pooling. So I do recommend getting something rigid to attach your paper to. And then of course, probably goes out without saying, but just a jar for water, paper towels, handy. And something I recently started using that is pretty basic for most people, but I was just kind of lazy and I don't even have a hair dryer, but one of my students actually donated one to me. So now I have a hair dryer that I can dry my paintings with and not have to wait so long in between layers because I like to do a lot of glazing and a lot of wet on dry techniques. So having a hair dryer handy, definitely a plus. Highly recommended. All right, so now I've got a mess up here. And yeah, that was pretty much everything that I use in my studio to do watercolors. I'll do a separate video for ink supplies. There's a lot less that goes into my ink supplies. And eventually I'll do a short video on my watercolor sketching supplies. But I think that this is a good start. I don't think you need to have all of this stuff. This is just what you will likely see in my videos. And as I said, if you are interested in anything that... I use. I have that link to my Amazon list in the description and those are not affiliate links. I do not get any kind of kickback from that at all. These are just what I genuinely use and what I would recommend or what I can recommend because you know I've kind of stuck with these supplies. I've found that these work really well for me. I've ditched a lot of the cheaper supplies that I used to use when I was starting out. And this is kind of what I see myself sticking with for a while. So check them out if you are in the market for new supplies. And thanks so much for checking in. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye.